Good afternoon, good evening to everybody around the world. I see uh, many familiar names on this, so it's great to see you all, or at least uh, be seen by you. Um, I love talking about NISAR. Uh, it is a very exciting mission to be launched in, in the near future. Many of you uh, I see have probably heard much of this talk before, uh, but I will try to give it uh, a fresh look as I always do when I talk about it and give you some updates on our status. Okay, here's the outline for the talk. As the title says, uh, I'm gonna be talking about techniques and technologies. Uh, primarily in this, of course, the techniques and technologies are interrelated, uh, difficult to tease apart completely, so you'll see somewhat of a mix here, but I tried to segregate them a little bit just to keep it clear. First, I'll start with an overview, and I'll finish with a status. All right, so for those of you who are not familiar with NISAR, it stands for NASA ISRO SAR. Uh, mission. It's a science mission in the, in the sense that uh, NASA, on the NASA side, we tend to define our requirements based on community uh, surveys of science needs in the United States, and then NASA selects missions which can meet those science requirements. And in the case of NISAR, it evolved from a, a decadal survey in 2007 uh, and led to a concept called DESDENY. After our partnership with ISRO, it became NISAR. And we're, we're primarily studying three main science disciplines, which are quite broad in and of themselves. We're looking at the dynamics of ice, uh, trying to understand the relationship of ice sheets and glaciers, uh, sea ice to uh, climate and uh, sea level rise. We're looking at ecosystems, in particular, biomass and biomass change and how they relate to the carbon cycle, also studying agriculture and wetlands. And we're looking at solid earth deformation, and in particular, the ways uh, that hazards can be uh, understood from the motions uh, before, during, and after earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, and other you know, catastrophic events. India has a, spe a special set of needs. They're interested in all of these uh, discipline areas, but they're also interested in local phenomena, coastal processes within India, particularly ag agricultural uses and other resource management uses in the Indian region. So it's, it's a very comprehensive mission. And you'll see, I think, through this talk uh, that the observation plan reflects the comprehensiveness of these measurements. On the left, you see a number of the science uh, products that we will be producing. We'll talk more about that as we go along. So the observation overview in a nutshell is on this slide. You can see the characteristics are listed on the left and what those enable. Uh, it is a two frequency uh, radar mission, synthetic aperture radar mission. Uh, the two wavelengths are 24 centimeter wavelength and 9.4 centimeter wavelength. NASA is providing the uh, 24 centimeter. ISRO is providing the electronics for the 9 centimeter. It, we use a technique called SweepSAR. I'll talk more about in the, in the coming slides to, to deliver a large swath, 240 kilometer swath, which enables an exact 12 day repeat orbit for doing interferometry and for getting global coverage. The system is polarimetric. We typically operate it in dual pole. I'll talk more about those trades later, but we can also operate in single pole and quad pole and other forms of polarization if desired. Uh, the resolutions are uh, variable in range. Uh, as those of you who are familiar with SAR know, the azimuth resolution in strip map is relatively fixed by the antenna size. So on the order of six or seven meters in this case, for our 12 meter uh, diameter uh, antenna. But in range, we can select the bandwidth and that varies between three meters at the highest resolution, typically 10 meters uh, at the nominal resolution, but uh, we can of course go to coarser resolution if necessary. NASA always defines their missions for three years uh, and then continues those missions as the, as the science is compelling and the, the health of the system is maintained. Uh, ISRO has defined their, uh, their 
primary mission is five years. So clearly we will be operating this jointly for five years. And uh, we use this five-year duration and hopefully longer to, to develop time series. We have pointing and orbit control that's suitable for interferometry. And one of the key features of this mission is that for L-band, the duty cycle is 50% uh, uh, nominally, it actually can be much more. So we can, we can pretty much image all land and ice plus other areas, ocean areas, coastal areas, every cycle, uh, which is similar to, for example, Sentinel-1, but uh, even greater duty cycle than they're operating at the moment. Another interesting and unique feature of this mission is while most, uh, most radar missions point their antenna towards the north, we actually point it towards the south and look at the uninterrupted time series of Antarctica primarily, relying on missions like Sentinel-1 as part of the Copernicus constellation to fill in the Arctic. So we can look left and right, but we have chosen to operate the mission only looking towards the south. You can see some of our uh, science targets here. This is the observational geometry. We're at 747 kilometers altitude. Uh, I'll say more about the system. And the swath is 240 kilometers in this incidence angle range you see here in a 6 a.m., 6 p.m. orbit. For all modes at all polarizations, we observe the entire swath here at 240 kilometers, which is also a unique feature of this SWEEPSAR system. So a little bit more detail on the flight system itself. Uh, we have a 12 meter diameter deployable mesh antenna built by Northrop Grumman. Uh, it's uh, basically gold coated molybdenum um, mesh with a rigid truss that deploys from a tightly stowed volume. If you go to our website, you can see some uh, animations of that deployment. It's a nine meter boom. And uh, this is roughly three or four meter long uh, main structure. This uh, octagonal cylinder here houses all of the electronics for the system. The bus back here is, uh, is where the avionics for the spacecraft are, the pul propulsion is. These are the solar arrays. You can see that uh, if you look through this table in detail, I won't spend too much time on it, NASA provides a substantial amount of the hardware. ISRO also provides an equally substantial, if not greater, proportion of the hardware. So this is a truly enabling mission and very tightly intercoupled in terms of the development. So NASA is providing the reflector and the boom, as well as the structure here and all the L-band electronics, which is quite sizable physically. Uh, ISRO is providing the S-band electronics, which uh, is, is high, uh, housed inside here, plus the bus and the launch vehicle. It's, you can see here the mass, it's a fairly substantial system. And because these are two high powered radars, the power uh, needed for operating them is also quite substantial. Very, very um, impressive set of, of statistics in my view. Uh, we also have GPS and a large uh, um, onboard recorder uh, and a very high rate telecom system. There's actually two telecom systems, one that is used for the downlink of the L-band data, one that's used for the downlink of the S-band data. They share a common gimbal antenna, but the electronics are, are built by NASA and ISRO separately. This is our operations overview. It's a fairly busy slide, but I'll just focus on um, a few aspects of it. So we have a fairly regular observation plan that I'm gonna show you in a minute, but we uh, update that every six months, hopefully with uh, relatively minor tweaks. We also accept uh, urgent response requests in, in the event of natural disasters. Um, and that goes into an operations uh, planning stage that produces a new plan basically every week. Those plans are then communicated to ISRO for uplink to the spacecraft, which is uh, owned and operated by ISRO. And that uh, then defines the observation plan for a week or two. The observations are made and the uh, data are acquired and stored on board and then downlinked by the two downlink systems that I mentioned. The uh, LSAR data is downlinked through a four gigabit per second KA band downlink to 
uh, NASA supported stations. Some of them are commercial, some of them are NASA owned for an average daily data volume of 35 terabits per day, which is pretty substantial amount of data. I think somewhat unprecedented for uh, SAR missions and maybe any earth orbiting mission. The S-band data is downlinked separately to ISRO ground stations, uh, either in India or in Antarctica. And they have a 2.9 gigabit per second downlink rate, which is also quite substantial for a total average daily volume of around eight terabits per day. And I can tell you, you'll see the observation plan in a second, but uh, these data volumes per day or data rates uh, seem high, but we somehow have filled up the entire, <laughs> entire allocation. So there's an insatiable need for data by the science community. Uh, and uh, more capacity, I think, would even be welcome. Uh, you can, we talked about the orbit before. It's a sun-synchronous frozen orbit in a dawn-dusk 12-day uh, repeating ground track. Our observation concept, we have attempted to make as uh, simple and systematic as possible. That said, uh, there's a lot of complexity to it, and optimizing the plan has been rather a challenge and uh, occupied the science team for the years during development. Um, we're trying to minimize radar mode contention and try to uh, uh, fix the pattern uniformly over each 12 day cycle as much as possible. Uh, we do cull observations in the areas towards the north and south where there's cons considerable overlap of the radar swaths to save data volume. Um, and of course, sea ice changes its extent over time and other areas uh, have seasonal effects. So there is some seasonal variability, but uh, for the most part, we have tried to fix the plan. We also have a mechanism in place as a high level requirement to, um, to uh, accommodate urgent response requests. So we have mechanisms for fast uplink, fast downlink and uh, fast processing to support that. It's not operational per se, but uh, it's a best efforts basis. So there are literally thousands of possible modes uh, that this radar can support. And uh, sorry, I have a very sensitive mouse, but we have attempted to, to uh, employ an observation strategy that only uses a small subset of these possible modes partly for uh, testing uh, efficiency purposes, but also just because of the, uh, the desire for a fixed and regular observation plan. So this is not the exact plan. This is just representative of the modes that we intend to be using uh, when we operate the system. DP stands for dual pole, as you can imagine, SP, single pole, QP, quad pole, CP, uh, compact pole. And this is the L-band modes that we're using and S-band modes that we're using. There's some variability and, and variance of this in the current plan, but this gives you a good idea of what we're doing. Sort of a nominal dual pole mode um, for uh, background for most of the land surface, uh, higher resolution over land ice, lower resolution over sea ice, and then for urban areas and agriculture, we have high resolution quad pole where possible. Uh, over India and its environs and, and a good deal of Antarctica as well, we are looking at um, dual operation of L and S together. And the, the mode combinations are, multi, are, are varied, but uh, this gives you some idea of dual pole and quad pole uh, over India and uh, using compact pole or dual pole cases. So it's, you can see there's lots of op opportunities here for studying new combinations of frequency and polarization in a, in a sort of regional or global context. Um, this is telling you how we're doing the observations. We are observing almost everywhere, ascending and descending. So we get two looks every 12 days at any given spot on the ground. And one S equal one P means that we're observing every time we come over. At the higher latitudes, we do cull by latitude, but most, for the most part, every spot on ground is covered once ascending and descending each cycle. 
Here's a representative uh, observation plan. Uh, this is actually showing ascending and descending, but you can only see one uh, because of the way it's been plotted. But this shows you uh, that we have, we're, we're attempting to have a fairly uniform uh, observation plan. The colors refer to the modes that you saw on the previous slide. I think the mapping is not one-to-one -one on the colors, but it just is a representative look at uh, where we're looking at sea ice, land ice. Uh, over the US, we have a high resolution dual pole mode. Background land is a lower resolution dual pole mode. India has its own set of uh, joint LNS band modes, and then Antarctica. So it's a, it's, and this plan repeats to first order every 12 days um, for the life of the mission. So some people say this seems to be a bit of overkill uh, since a lot of places aren't changing that fast, but you would be surprised at how, uh, how excited the community has become about this, the, this promise of a very regular uh, time series, any place on earth that they can look. This of course does lead to a very large amount of data, uh, 1.6 petabytes of raw data each year uh, that need to be processed to higher level products. And uh, we, uh, unlike I think any other mission currently, are processing these data to high level product, higher level products that, than most SAR missions. So we have uh, three main products that are being created by the, uh, by the project itself. And these are leading to 20, uh, sorry, 70 terabytes of uh, data per day. And that's level zero data, which is raw data available to anybody if you want to do your own SAR processing. Uh, level one products, which are described down here, it's the single look complex imagery, as well as derived interferograms on the nearest neighbor in time, and covariance products uh, related to the polarimetry. We also produce level two products for the first time a geocoded SLC, which is, uh, these two are very large volume products as well as geocoded covariance products and unwrapped phase products. So these higher level products here, I think are somewhat of a first and available everywhere uh, at the, the distributed active archive center, which is the Alaska satellite facility. We actually already have some sample products based on our UAV SAR airborne system for L-band that you can go to this link and download if you're uh, interested. Another key feature of NASA's current science program uh, is to try to go to open source software algorithms as well as the open data, which is their policy for a long time. So in that spirit, NISAR is trying to push the envelope. We have already open sourced the software that creates these products. The software is uh, still under development, but as any good open source uh, software development uh, goes, we, um, we will be updating this and accepting good ideas from the community through the open source development principles. So we are still a year or two from, from launch and there's plenty of time for community input and, uh, and for improvement. But the software is effectively done to produce these level two products. There's a few more things that need to be added to it. There is some bulk reprocessing of the data that occurs, assuming that it's not perfect the first time. And this requires a pretty um, extensible system. All of the data is being processed on the cloud and then uh, archived in the cloud. Uh, this is also a first, I think, for NASA. And that allows us to scale up and down as needed the resources uh, to process the forward processing as well as reprocessing. So here's some examples of the products, uh, the kinds of products we would be producing. Some of these are level two products. Some of them are higher level products. We make uh, interferograms which track deformation of Earth's surface. This is an earthquake that you see uh, from, uh, from California showing the fringes of surface deformation along the ruptures here. And this one had two ruptures and captured actually several earthquakes here. We also can measure the decorrelation of the surface, which is a proxy for the damage that may have occurred, the disruption of the surface. This is something that uh, has been starting to be widely adopted for urgent response 
in many cases. We look at the deformation of landslides. We're looking at the ice sheet velocities and how they're changing over time. Since we can make an ice sheet velocity map every uh, cycle uh, effectively, uh, we can see how that velocity is changing. The dynamics are definitely of interest for modeling uh, how the ice sheets interact with uh, the climate. Similarly, for sea ice uh, in Antarctica in particular, we're seeing all the sea ice regularly every three days uh, and can track the motion uh, of the sea ice. In the ecosystems area, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at biomass mapping, looking at crop area extent, wetlands area extent, as well as uh, disturbance related to biomass changes and crop changes. Something also that was added recently as a result of uh, our, sorry, as a result of our uh, 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 Office of the President's uh, uh, direction was a global soil moisture product. This is the only product higher than level two that we will be producing globally. Uh, this is because soil moisture is so useful for so many things, including climate studies, as well as agriculture and food security. Um, so this is, a, this is going to be produced globally uh, at the same time as these lo lower level level two products. The higher level products, similar to the ones I showed on the previous page for the science disciplines, will be created only at validation sites. And those validation sites were chosen so that we could argue that uh, if you take the level two data and apply our algorithms any place in the world, we'll be able to produce level three products that meet our science requirements. And to, uh, to convince ourselves of that, we have a fairly extensive calibration and validation program associated with the mission that entails for image calibration, a large number of corner reflectors that will be deployed in Alaska, in Oklahoma and uh, California, as well as uh, ISRO having their own set of corner reflectors in India. In addition to the image calibration, we have a, a large number, over a hundred uh, uh, science validation sites that include uh, ecosystem sites where we're measuring trees, uh, surface roughness, soil moisture, that kind of thing, as well as GPS arrays that measure surface deformation on a regular basis. And we're deploying GPS and other sensors in the cryosphere in order to be able to track the motions there and compare to the data. We also have our airborne system where we're looking at uh, phase calibration associated with that. NISAR is a science mission, as I mentioned, and uh, we have a requirement to, to basically prove that we can meet the, the science requirements that we've defined. And in order to do that uh, in the pre-launch phase, we've defined a science performance tool that takes um, the global observation plan that we've defined, uh, our knowledge of the surface, such as we know it at L band, and understanding the scattering properties, the decorrelation properties of the surface, and so forth, and uh, the atmosphere and how it varies over time and affects our propagation signal. And we put it into a, an error model and estimate globally what that performance might look like. And we have performance metrics for the most challenging of them including solid earth and biomass metrics, as well as uh, glacier velocity and disturbance metrics. So we can estimate on a global scale based on the mission design what we think the performance will be. Uh, solid earth and biomass are colored here because those are the examples of our metrics. Um, you know, for the biomass down here, you see we have a requirement to, uh, to for over 80% of the world to be able to measure to accuracy better than 20 megagrams per hectare. And this shows based on our analysis that we do very well with that. These are our various uh, solid earth requirements up here. And the ones that are in green show that we are meeting our requirements with, with plenty of margin. So these are, uh, give us confidence that the plan that we've developed uh, is good as the radar is built, the emission is built, we can track how well we're doing against these requirements. 
And just to quickly add that for the various um, disciplines that we have, there's a lot of cross-disciplinary uh, activity that we, we, we expect these data to be used for in the areas of hazards, carbon cycle monitoring, hydrology, climate, and resource management. All of these things are interrelated, and uh, the data that we acquire will be uh, really sort of a watershed in, in uh, interdisciplinary studies. So let me go quickly into some techniques. Many of these are familiar to you. Uh, some of them might be a little bit new. So primarily, I think I've alluded to this already, we use repeat pass interferometry for surface deformation and coherence measurements. Uh, we use polarimetry primarily for ecosystem studies. We have a split spectrum waveform capability that uh, we use for ionosphere correction. Um, and we use a variable pulse rate uh, in order to uh, have continuous swaths. I'll say more about that in a minute. And uh, we use time series with these 12 day repeats on ascending and descending to get the long term deformation or uh, disturbance signals that we're interested in. Dual wavelengths uh, helps us in increase our dynamic range of sensitivity and we use target dependent mode selection. So I think many of you on the call are probably familiar with the utility of polarimetric and interferometric SAR for these kinds of observations. Uh, de depending on the surface type, polarization can, uh, will, this, the polarization can give you a uh, unique signature of what uh, that surface type is. So vegetation tends to um, randomize the polarization. So the cross polarization term will give you a strong return. What you're looking at here, and sorry about this. What you're looking at here in, in red, green, and blue are the horizontally polarized, vertically polarized, and, uh, and uh, cross polarized term in green. So these greenish things are vegetation and the brownish things would be a combination of uh, HH and uh, VV. So you can see that in this uh, one area, there's a very large range of scattering mechanisms that uh, lead to uh, information about what's on the surface. For interferometric SAR, we are doing repeat pass here. So we fly over once, we make an observation, and then if the ground moves between those observations, we can measure the change in the motion, which would be this distance here, through the interferometric uh, phase comparison. So we fly over once, fly over again, and get the deformation of the surface. And that uh, we use for studying earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, and, and actually aquifers for water resource management. For the uh, ecosystems area, although there are many techniques under development, primarily what we're looking at um, as, as our, to meet our requirements is the relationship between the backscatter and the biomass. And we have studied this for many years using airborne data and spaceborne data and shown pretty good correlation between uh, the biomass and backscatter levels in a variety of biomes. Each biome has its own set of calibration curves. And part of our plan is to, uh, is to update all of those curves to make these biomass maps. Of course, any more sophisticated techniques can be applied because the data will be available to anybody. So there's some examples of science targets. This is a very nice study using Sentinel over wetlands in India. It was done by our Indian colleagues with us and uh, showing areas of inundation just by tracking the backscatter uh, level changes over time. Uh, changing dramatically over time. So this is an example of the kind of time series analysis we would like to do. Uh, here's an example of deformation of a volcano in the Indian region done with our Indian colleagues, uh, also using time series analysis. So let's talk a little bit more about the split spectrum technique. So we have bandwidth options on the L-band side uh, where we can transmit um, a 20 megahertz bandwidth and then uh, a five megahertz bandwidth basically at the same time. This is a spectrum, so frequency across this axis. 
We also have other modes with different bandwidths that allow us to split the spectrum in a, in a similar way. S-band does not have the split spectrum methodology, although for the wider bandwidth uh, cases, of course, you can create a split spectrum synthetically on the ground. So we use this in order to help uh, correct for the ionosphere. And that's uh, shown here schematically. I'll, I'll try not to go into too much detail, but on one pass, we, uh, we create uh, an image, two images actually, one in the lower band and one in the upper band. And then we fly over 12 days later and make another observation in the same bands. From each of these bands, we can form an interferogram, which gives us a phase that is related to the deformation that we're interested in. This delta LOS is what we're interested in and a term related to the ionosphere, which has a frequency dependence that's different from the, uh, the uh, other the line of sight displacement. We can do the same thing with the upper band, and now we have um, two interferograms, basically, one at the lower band and one at the upper band. We can take those uh, two interferograms and solve for the deformation of the atmosphere, uh, deformation and the atmosphere, and the ionosphere through this uh, scaling argument. So with these two observations, we can solve for the non-dispersive, shall we say, displacements and the uh, dispersive ionospheric displacement. So by doing this, we can remove ionospheric signals from the data. We have examples of this already from ALOS. Uh, this is a typical interferogram you might see from ALOS 2, which is also L-band. And uh, so you can see all these fringes that for interferometric fringes, you may say are deformation, but in fact, once you apply the ionospheric correction, you get a much cleaner uh, signal that uh, doesn't have all those fringes in it. Here's a time series of these images um, over the Los Angeles area. You can see very variable ionosphere, but by applying the split spectrum technique that I just described, you can remove all that and create a time series of uh, motion in the Southern California area that shows the motion of the tectonic plates one next to another. So ALOS can do this with relatively sparse data. With NISAR and its 12-day repeats ascending and descending, you can imagine the, the quality of the uh, geodetic measurements here will be just absolutely astounding. In terms of the technologies, um, we talked about SweepSAR uh, earlier. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that as we go on here. We have uh, gallium nitride transmit receive modules. The so transmit is where the power is needed. These are, I think, a first uh, at L-band at least in space. And there's 24 of these TR modules, 12 for, uh, 12 for uh, um, uh, H-pole and 12 for B-pole. Uh, S-band has, uh, twice the number, and they have higher power TR modules uh, for their system. So all, both of these are sort of first of a kind for these uh, systems. Uh, at LBAN, we have direct digital sampling uh, at, I think it's 12 or 14 bit, 12 bits, I believe. And these uh, directly sampled data, um, this is directly sampled at uh, LBAN frequencies. So it's digital, digitally heterodyne down to baseband. And uh, these are fed into FPGAs for digital beam forming, which also I believe is a first in space. We have this very high rate uh, downlink system, which was developed specially for this system. A 12 meter deployable mesh antenna, first time that's been deployed in low earth orbit. And uh, the co-located cloud processing that I mentioned earlier is also for NASA at least a first. We also have low latency capability. So let's say a little bit more about uh, SweepSAR. So SweepSAR is a technique where you transmit over all the TR modules in this case, you can see the red flash there, you transmit over the whole uh, array, which illuminates a narrow spot on the reflector, which then by optics will illuminate the entire swath on the ground. And then uh, echoes from the pulse that you transmit uh, propagate, or the pulse propagates across the swath and echoes come back uh, towards the reflector and are received here. So the effective area of, um, of the uh, reflected signal on the feed is 
roughly three of these TR modules wide at L band. And that's this gray box here. So these are the pulses, and this is fast time going across here. You can see that because of the width of the swath and the need to pulse at a particular rate in order to not undersample the, uh, the azimuth spectrum, uh, we have multiple pulses in the air, multiple pulses in the swath at a given time. So because we're using a TR module, transmit and receive or same module, when we are transmitting, we have to turn off the receiver. So we actually have gaps in the receive swath. But uh, more importantly, because of the extent of the receive signal um, on the uh, feed array, we have to combine, we should combine the signals from three adjacent, three or more adjacent swath, uh, adjacent uh, TR modules to get the optimal signal. So that's the sweeps are principle. This shows you the receive pattern of each of the individual um, individual TR modules. So we have 12 TR modules at L band and they each have their own uh, pattern associated with them. And you can see that, uh, that if you're illuminating three or more of these things that you're going to get, uh, you're going to get a return of any given target on the ground over multiple uh, received channels. So we have to, uh, we have to do some uh, waiting at and summation of multiple channels to maximize the signal. So this is uh, a simulation showing what we would get if we just used one of the received channels to reconstruct our signal, three of them, three adjacent one, five and seven. And you can see if you just use one, you get a signal that is lower in power, lower in gain and rather um, variable uh, from across the swath. Whereas if you use three, you've already derived most of the benefit because of the narrowness of these, uh, these individual patterns. By adding them up, you get pretty much the same thing at three, five, and seven taps. So we have adopted for simplicity a three-tap beam former, which is done through the digital, uh, through the FPGAs. And the errors are pretty small. This shows you the architecture for the electronics. We have the 12 TR modules at L band that I mentioned before. Four of these feed uh, what's called the quad first stage processor. There is one FPGA in here and four uh, analog to digital converters. Uh, so the signal are directly sampled, uh, directly sampled at L band down to uh, uh, 240 megahertz sampling rate and filtered and then uh, decimated and beamformed in order to create a partially beamformed signal in each three of these blocks. Uh, those signals are then sent to a second stage processor where the final stage of beamforming across these blocks is conducted. Uh, and then it's formatted and sent to the ground, to, sent to the telecom system. So it's a sort of simple uh, architecture in in concept, primarily a digital radar. So um, if we, we have done, so we are in the testing phase now and we've shared, we've um, created a test case where we can inject a tone, four tones uh, into these TR modules. We split them and, and so we, we have a 1220 megahertz, 1230, 1240, 1250 megahertz tone. Uh, uh, injected into these four and the same tones injected into uh, other, the other groups of four. So if you look at a spectrogram, this is one pulse, pulses worth of data where we take very short FFTs and stack them up over time here. So this is frequency versus time. You can see these tones, uh, this base banded tones, one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, eight. And it shows you the operation of SweepSAR where we turn on, uh, we, we open a receive window for uh, channel one, and it receives uh, the signal with a weighting uh, that is appropriate for the receive pattern of that particular TR module. Uh, we also then turn on two and three, and you can see that if you draw a line vertically, there's only three that are active at any one time, which reflects the fact that this is a three tap beamformer. These are the transmit events where we have to turn off the receiver. So we have these gaps that have to be filled in. 
And by, by, uh, by doing this happens, you know, a thousand times per second. And we, um, we uh, then sum up these signals in the, in the first stage processors in a three tap beam forming sense. So this is actual data through the actual flight hardware. It's looking pretty good uh, so far. Testing is going quite well. So these gaps in the swath are not great if you are interested in a signal that happens to be in the gap. So we've been looking at uh, the effects of uh, the gaps and how we can mitigate them. And uh, we actually have done quite a bit of work with our colleagues at DLR who have thought about this for their tandem L concept quite a bit, quite deeply. So uh, we've looked at various uh, data sets and tried to understand the impacts of gaps. This is a case where you, where you have no gap, where it says none here. Here's a case where you have a constant gap. You just have a fixed pulse repetition frequency and the gap stays there. You would not have any observations in this gap. Then we looked at ways of varying the PRF, varying the pulse repetition frequency, so you get a linear uh, sort of zigzag pattern in the gap location. We looked at random, we looked at uh, quasi uh, dwelled linear, and we've looked at random dwell. So we looked at a number of different cases and simulated imagery from our uh, airborne sensors as best we could with the right noise levels. And, uh, you know, to the eye, you can't see a lot of difference here. If you look at the details, there are subtle differences between the images. But uh, through analysis, we've optimized it so that we've, we believe we've minimized the impact of these gaps. And we will like, very likely go with uh, something like a dwell, uh, one of these dwell cases uh, for the actual operation. So there will not be gaps in the data. We've had to do a number of science trades along the way. Um, Quadpole is something the ecosystems uh, community would have liked to have seen everywhere, but it is quite a bit more data. And in fact, the, uh, the, uh, the variable PRF method does not work so well for NISAR for a number of technical reasons, mostly because the antenna is too small. So we have chosen uh, to have dual pole dense time series uh, as our baseline for ecosystems measurements, which is also suitable for the, for the uh, solid earth and cryosphere. They're not so interested in the polarimetry. So for those of you who want global uh, quad pole measurements, I'm afraid NISAR is not going to deliver that to you, at least in the current plan. Um, there's also a trade study between linear and compact pole. Much of the world is very excited about compact pole capability. The mission can do it, but our science community has uh, settled on linear polarization for historical reasons. Uh, and their algorithms work best with that. They understand the properties of that best. Uh, we've also looked at using um, dual pole at lower bandwidth to single pole at higher bandwidth. This really uh, is a battle between the ecosystems and the solid earth people who want the finest possible resolution. We've compromised on uh, for those places where we have this choice, urban areas and agricultural areas. We've settled on this 40 megahertz dual pole configuration. We also had a trade study of looking right and left versus looking just towards Antarctica. As I mentioned before, we've settled on looking towards the left. The community has also been arguing about whether we want a traditional uh, range Doppler single look complex image as our product to be delivered to the community or a geocoded single look complex image. We have not been able to make a resolution. So NASA at the moment is carrying both and the user can pick which one they want probably wasteful and by the time we launch we may have settled on one versus the other but we'll see how that goes i think the cloud environment offers a lot of new opportunities and then many on the science team have argued that we don't need to process all these data into full imagery and products we should 
process some subset or not save them and just uh, process on demand as users need them. We are going to go with full global processing. That's our requirement. And we believe we'll make the data much more usable. And finally, this fixed versus variable PRF uh, that I mentioned earlier, we are planning to do variable PRF where, it's, where it gives us the appropriate performance for quad pole measurements, which we do have in many places, it will be fixed PRF. So now just a few hardware pictures to round things out for the status. These are a little bit dated. Uh, we are farther along than this. This was from last uh, year when we were doing thermal vac testing of the L-band hardware. This is that octagonal structure that I mentioned before. These are the TR modules, the silver boxes on the top and bottom here. Covered up in uh, foil here is the radiating elements at L-band. The S-band electronics, which has since been added, goes in this dark area on the interior. And I'll show you a picture of that later. There it is in the chamber. Oopsie. We also have a very, uh, very uh, robust test program for the mechanical system because it really has to work. <laughs> We're very keen on that. This is the actual flight model for the uh, reflector. You can see the gold mesh here, 12 meter in diameter with its truss structure. And you can see its scale relative to those people. This is the same, uh, the same reflector in its stowed configuration, the flight model itself. This flight model with the flight boom, which you see here in its, uh, its stowed configuration, has been integrated with a mass mock-up of the actual uh, electronics uh, structure. This looks real, but it's actually just a, a mock-up of that structure here. And so the thermal vac testing for the mechanical with a mass mock-up of the structure uh, was essential for making sure that this system uh, performs well, will deploy reliably. Uh, and I include this picture mostly because you can see it. this is what it's going to look like pretty much when it's actually finished. We have a lot of non-radar hardware, as I mentioned, the solid state recorder built by Airbus, um, pyro firing mechanisms, GPS receivers, and uh, the, the KA band downlink system. These are all all new developments, all kind of pressing the limits of what has been done before. And all that integration is going quite well at this point. Our ISRO colleagues delivered the S-band system last year in June of, uh, we, we gave them this uh, structure to mount their hardware on back in 2019. They have since uh, mounted the hardware and delivered it to JPL. This is an early figure, but we are now fully integrated. So this is our overall schedule flow. Uh, we have divided the integration and test program into four stages. SIT-1 was just uh, integrating the radar and doing this, uh, this dynamics testing. SIT-2 was integrating S and uh, L together, and that has been completed. There's the SRINT, and then that came in and fed into the integration with uh, with the LSAR, and now we're in this third stage, sorry, third stage of INT, where uh, we're going to be, uh, we're integrating in the engineering payload right now, and we'll soon be integrating all the um, mechanical back together for a final fully integrated uh, thermal vacuum test. Once that's all done, this is all, this hardware is all at JPL. Once that's done, it's going to be sent to India for integration with the spacecraft bus, which is under development right now. And eventually we will launch uh, the spacecraft. You see there are no dates for this right now because we've been hit a little bit by the pandemic and are having a little difficulty predicting exactly when we're gonna launch. We're expecting sometime in 2023. So I hope uh, you get a feel for the exciting hardware, the exciting technology and techniques that we're going to apply to create this first ever L-band, the dense uh, spatially and temporally time series, uh, and also first dual L and S-band observations over significant portions of the Earth, natural laboratories of the Earth. 
We'll have global products to level two. They'll be fully available, openly available to the global community. And uh, a number of enabling technologies and techniques here, as well as enabling partnership with our great colleagues, uh, ISRO. Um, we have comprehensive coverage, rapid sampling, and I think interdisciplinary research will really be um, pushed forward through this mission. As I mentioned, the launch date, we're, we're looking at 2023. We're not exactly sure when. It's looking like later 2023 now, unfortunately, but that's the way it goes. If you want to know more about the mission, uh, please go to our website. Uh, you'll find a handbook there, which is um, a PDF that describes the mission in great detail. It's a little dated, but the mission has not changed much over the six or seven years of development. So it's pretty current and will give you a great overview of what the mission's about. So I have a couple pictures here um, of the of the uh, hardware in our JPL high bay here. This, these are also a little bit dated. We have a, a cool thing called a hollow lens, which allows us to superimpose a CAD model. And you put on glasses uh, to see what the thing looks like. Uh, as you'll never see it on the ground because it, you can't deploy this 12 meter reflector fully in space in, in, on the ground. So this is what you would see if you were in a high bay wearing these glasses you get a real sense for the size of this structure. So I would invite you all to come to JPL, but with the COVID protocols, uh, unfortunately, very few people can get in right now. But uh, anyway, that's, that's my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I think I left a few minutes for questions, but uh, please, uh, thank you very much for listening. Yes, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, if anybody has questions, uh, use Zoom to raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, first question is William Priestner. Are you there, William? Uh, yes. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Will. Great. Hi, Paul. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, lots of great detail. And I love those photos, especially uh, of the space vehicle uh, with the 3D glasses. I just had a quick question. Um, I've seen a lot about the mission extension capabilities that Northrop Grumman has been working on and, um, and some other uh, small companies as well. And I was wondering if there are any serviceable parts uh, or, or any designs to support servicing of the satellite once it's on orbit, um, should that be necessary? Over. That has never come up in conversation. I don't... I, you know, to be honest, there's quite a bit of hardware on the outside of the bus, as you know, may notice here, the TR modules and stuff that perhaps in theory could be serviced. Um, but there is no plan to do so. And I don't think any, any thought has been given to uh, making sure that a service vehicle could get in there and do something. But I'd be interested to talk more with you about that. That's kind of an interesting concept. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot for your answer. Okay, next question from the chat. Uh, can we use SAR interferometry to study relative sea level rise? If yes, how? So we do it, uh, we do study it uh, using interferometry. Uh, it's somewhat indirect in the sense that uh, we are looking at ice sheets and their evolution, and especially the dynamics, to try to understand better the physics of the ice sheets. That way we can um, use those as boundary conditions for climate models and predict sea level rise from that. The other way to look at it is uh, through looking at coastal erosion and deformation using interferometry because sea level rise is one aspect of it, but the impact of sea level rise has to do with what the coastlines themselves are doing. So in some cases, they may be rising due to some effect, in which case, if the sea level rises and the coast rises, perhaps there's less of a, uh, an issue. Uh, but in most cases, the coasts are eroding and sinking, and that exacerbates the problem of sea level rise. So we're not using the interferometry directly on the sea in this case, but indirectly through measuring the, the, uh, the cryosphere as well as the land deformation, we can 
we can make a strong contribution to sea level rise research. Okay, next question is from Baram Salehi. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. I have a quick uh, question on the, so you mentioned the, so this is obviously one of the kind uh, dual frequency L S bands. So when it comes to data, I think it's level one, if I'm correct. Uh, would we have uh, two SLC image, one for uh, S band, one for L band, for example, for ecosystem, the quad pole, so basically we have two quad pole on, in each for, for the two frequency, or it would, be, it would be a combined image of L plus S in uh, one single uh, quad pole image, or a uh, dual pole, sorry. Yeah, so uh, the answer is that they will be separate images. Uh, the L band data will be processed by NASA, uh, and it will be, uh, actually depending on how we do it you actually get two images for any one observation because of the split spectrum technique so primary product is the wide bandwidth uh, component but there's also this ancillary uh, small bandwidth uh, spectral component so you can get two l band images pr pr uh, primarily from that at the number of polarizations that you imaged uh, with so it's either dual pole quad pole or single pole um, for the s band side they can do single or uh, dual pole linear or circular pole they don't have a quad pole mode at the moment uh, and i don't think that, that the system can support quad pole if i'm not mistaken uh, those imagery will be processed separately by isro and distributed uh we're hoping in common formats and with common metadata so that if you are interested in a particular area, you go to whatever interface you have, you click on the region, you select L and S band from the, the list of products available, and it will deliver to you both the L and the S band in compatible formats, uh, compatible resolutions, sampling, and that kind of thing. Uh, we're working very hard to make a common set of data structures so that the users don't have to struggle with it, but they will be separate products. Okay, uh, another question from the chat. Uh, will the satellite acquire only L-band in US and only S-band in India or both in both the areas? Yeah, sorry if that was not clear. The L-band data is acquired everywhere. All land and ice covered surfaces over, uh, over the world. And that's acquired twice every 12 days, once on ascending and once on descending, at least. So L-band everywhere. The S-band data, for a number of technical reasons, will be mostly acquired over India, the regions around India uh, that are of scientific interest, such as the Himalayas and the coastal waters around India, as well as areas of Antarctica that are of, of interest to their um, scientific research uh, and sea ice primarily around the Indian ground station uh, or research base in Antarctica, because there's a lot of ship traffic down there and um, and uh, tracking that, understanding the sea ice characteristics is important for human safety and navigability. Uh, there are other S-band targets around the world uh, that we're considering. There is some excess capacity. We have CalVal sites that are both L and S-band. There's a large CalVal site for solid earth in uh, Western North America and we're probably going to add some in South America as well. So S-band is regional, L-band is global, is the best way to think of it. All right, well, thanks, Paul. Uh, I think we've run out of time. If there are any other questions, uh, you can probably email Paul at JPL. I think his email is readily available. Absolutely. Um, so, right. so thanks very much, and uh, and... Bye, everybody. Thank you, Leland. Bye.